Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We head over to meet Twangley Jack Ford in the York Shed for a weekly album review. And we play local, unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for the Arch Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can listen again. We repeat on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on Wickham Sound's Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So this week we're going to be chatting to uh, musician Mika England, but before we get to that, we're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for the latest instalment of formerly the rise and fall of a social network. This is a novel that I wrote, uh, myself, Dane Cobain. We've been serialising it across recent shows, so if you've missed an episode, feel free to listen on the catch-up. You can also check it out as an e-book, an audio book, and a paperback online on Amazon and all those good places. So, without further ado, formerly the rise and fall of a social network. Chapter 14 in the end, I sought help from the only person I could think of. Flick let me crash at her place. I slept on the sofa, much to the annoyance of her flatmate, a woman called Helen who occasionally wandered in for a glass of water in the middle of the night. When I explained what had happened, Flick showed no sign of surprise, but then she already knew my relationship's troubled history. In fact, she'd given me advice before, whether I'd asked for it or not. She'd even promised me a place to stay if anything went wrong. I guess it was time for her to make good on that promise. You can stay here as long as you want, she told me. I spoke to Helen and she's fine with you staying on the sofa as long as you help with the housework and chip in for the rent. Thanks, I said. That means a lot. I could use a place to hang my hat right now. You'll have to find somewhere for your stuff though. You're not going to be able to bring it all here. This is a temporary solution, not a new home. I'll put it into storage, I promised. It'll only need to stay there for a couple of weeks and then I can have it forwarded to Palo Alto. Dan, she said, clasping my hands in hers. You can talk to me about anything. You know that, right? I'm on your side. I know, I said. I leant in slowly and kissed her on her soft, gentle lips. She kissed me back and my heart raced with endorphins. Then we broke off the kiss and the moment was gone. We should go to work, she said. When we both arrived at the office, John told us that Peter had jetted off to Palo Alto. He's gone to meet with our investors again, he said. There are some papers to sign. He's also got some stuff to sort out at the new facility. Besides, we need to do some work on the servers and we don't trust anyone else to do it. What sort of work? I asked. John looked directly at me, his shrewd eyes boring into mine as though he was reading the schema on the back of my skull. Then he chuckled softly. If I told you that, I'd have to kill you, he replied. We're taking no chances with this one, Dan. I caught up with Flick over a cup of coffee. We snuck off to Starbucks, claiming our right to a rare lunch break. Kerry stared at us as we left the office together, and I could see his crazy brain trying to work out what was going on. Still, despite our hurried kiss that morning, there was nothing between us other than the shared relationship of two colleagues at a frenetic internet startup. We sat down at a table and nursed our coffees for several minutes. Then Flick broke the silence. I think something strange is going on, she said. Don't ask me why, but I'm getting bad vibes from the boys. I know what you mean, I told her, but I wouldn't admit it in front of them. I don't trust anyone. Not even me? Not even you, I laughed. But whatever's going on, I intend to find out. Oh yeah? She said. Can I help? You serious? I asked. You realise that we don't even know what we're looking for, right? We're fighting a war against shadows. Flick nodded. I just want the truth, she said. For Abby's sake. He shouldn't have died. If we were attacked by some unknown adversary, they should have killed John or Peter instead. They shouldn't have killed anyone, I replied. I didn't sign up for Me neither, but we're here now and we've got to make the best of it. We've got to find out what's going on or die trying. We need to do it for Abby. And for Mrs. Desi, I added. And so now, and for the kid who'll grow up without a father. Exactly, said Flick. Justice must be done. That evening, when Flick and I were back at her place watching reruns of Friends and eating popcorn on the sofa, she took a phone call from John. She disappeared into her bedroom, so I stretched out on the sofa with the remote and started flicking through the channels. Nothing was on, as usual. Flick emerged ten minutes later with a residue of tears around her eyes. That b****, she said, flopping down beside me. He wants me to go into the office. It's ten o'clock at night. What does he need you for, I asked. It's a bit late to call you in. That's what I said. 
In the end, he said I could stay here if I get some work done. And let me tell you, some serious work needs doing. Why? I asked. What's happened? The servers are down again, she grimaced. Peter called in from Cali. He's in a rage. The site is down across the globe. Even our backup servers can't take the strain. He's been trying to get third parties involved to take over any excess, but no one wants to handle our data. In some ways, I'm not surprised, I said. We're hot stuff at the moment. No wonder our servers are taking a kicking. Flick sighed, grabbed her laptop and started tapping away at the keyboard. There was still nothing on TV, so I put friends back on and grabbed my own machine. I was inundated with emails as soon as I turned it on. I sighed and began to work my way through them in an act of solidarity. It's the formerly way. If one of us is working, we all work. Flick's housemate came in a couple of hours later. She'd picked up a guy on a night out and brought him back home. Unfortunately for her, we were still up at two in the morning. The site was back online and Flick was working furiously to put out fires, the sweat dripping from her forehead. Calls to the office were being routed to her mobile phone and it ended up buzzing so often that she had to turn it off before we both went crazy. Oh hey Flick, Helen said, standing awkwardly by the door to her room. I thought you guys would be asleep by now. Don't you have work in the morning? What the f*** do you think we're doing right now? growled Flick. I didn't get much sleep that evening. Flick was working until an ungodly hour. Even though I slept for a while, curled up with her on the sofa with my head on her shoulder while she pounded the keys on her laptop, it wasn't true sleep, the kind of sleep that you get on a comfortable bed in a quiet room when you don't have to get up in the morning. At the office the following day, you could tell that no one had slept. John looked utterly exhausted with dark sacks around his eyes and an uncontrollable shake, like a man who'd had too much caffeine. Even Kerry looked tired, despite the fact that he had nothing to do with the infrastructure. My guess was that he'd been up late playing Call of Duty with his friends back in America. Only the juniors looked fresh, and that didn't last for long. John was in a foul temper, and he ordered them around like a madman. Go easy on them, John, I said, pulling him aside in the kitchen. The last thing we need now is a mistake. You're giving them more than they can handle. Hell, even if they all stayed here until midnight, they wouldn't get it done. You're forgetting that we don't have Abby anymore. I'm very much aware of our resources, Dan. Don't try to tell me how to do my job. Why don't you focus on your own work instead of worrying about everyone else? You're the boss, I replied, reluctantly. Truth be told, I was ahead of schedule. We were rolling out new functionality, a way to monetize our users by allowing them to buy virtual wreaths and artifacts, and most of my work was already done. I was waiting for Kerry to finish off the visuals so I could code them in and launch an alpha. As usual, he was taking his time. I tried to keep myself busy by cracking on with bug fixes and catching up with emails, but I'd gotten so much done the night before that I ran out of work by lunchtime, and Kerry said his renders wouldn't be ready until 3 o'clock. Flick was still busy dealing with the fallout from the server collapse, so I couldn't even sneak out for a drink with her. In the end, I booted up my journal and started to write. I hadn't updated it for a couple of weeks, and I didn't feel much like writing in it at Flick's place. Nothing says antisocial like typing in your journal when someone's sitting beside you and trying to talk to you. That said, trying to write a work was just as difficult, and I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. I looked up from my screen and saw John's piercing eyes locked in my direction. I gave him a swift thumbs up, which he failed to return, and then closed my journal and surfed the web at random until Kerry's files were ready. John went out to get coffee. When he got back, he went into a side room for a debriefing with Niels. When he came back out again, his face was the colour of a radish, and he called a quick team meeting to share the news. Okay, folks, he said, clapping his hands together. Listen up. Now, as you know, we've been working with Niels and his security firm to make things safer around here. We don't want any work-related accidents now, do we? You mean like what happened to Abby? Flick murmured. I ignored her. So here's the deal, John continued. Niels and his men have been working hard to keep the office safe, and we've stepped up security inside and out. But protecting ourselves isn't enough. We need to get out there and go on the offensive, which is why I asked Niels to look into who it is that's been trying to break into our offices. And did you find anything out? I asked. John grinned. Of course I did. You still with that woman of yours, Dan? Sarah? I asked. No, we went our separate ways. Good, John replied, the smile vanishing from his face to be replaced by a look of sincerity. Make sure it stays that way. Those goons who keep trying to break into the office, we managed to track them back to the next web. Hired on the orders of Alex, their editor. You mean the guy that died? The very same, John said. I guess his shady dealings came back to haunt him. Flick shuddered. Shouldn't we go to the police? She asked. John spun around to look at her. Hell no, he scowled. Let them figure that out by themselves. 
The good news is they won't be coming back anytime soon. But if you tell the cops about this, then they're going to start asking more questions. I don't like questions, so don't ask anymore. Get back to work, folks. There's a lot for us to do. It was several weeks later, and our move to Palo Alto was imminent. John was in the best mood I'd seen him in for months, presumably because the media storm had finally died down after Abby's final send-off at a quiet ceremony in North London. The press weren't invited, and neither were we, which didn't surprise us. We memorialised him with a wake of our own in the office. John also agreed to use his name for one of the new variables that we were coding into the system. There were plenty of tears when the code went live. One last reminder that he'd never again saunter into the office with his mother's lal mans. I was sitting with Flick and Kerry at the table in the kitchen when John came in with a tray of coffee and a huge smile on his face. He handed out the coffee and told us to head to the boardroom for a surprise announcement. Five minutes later, the entire company was gathered around the boardroom table. John entered last and closed the door behind him. It was hot, too hot, and the stifling air clawed at my throat and nostrils. I opened a window to let some air in, but the roar of traffic drifted in with the breeze and John told me to close it again. I reluctantly did as I was told. Okay, listen up, said John, clapping his hands together and jerking me out of my reverie. Now that we're all here, are you ready to hear the news? We all grunted in agreement, like an unruly class of school children complying with a school teacher. Good, he continued. Now, as you all already know, we're moving to Palo Alto in just under a month. Now, unfortunately, not everyone is going to be able to make it. Elaine here is going to stay behind to turn this place into our accounts office, and to make sure we have a base whenever we're travelling. We might even hire further staff over here to turn it into a secondary office, but make no mistake about it, our new home is Palo Alto. Formerly is going places, ladies and gentlemen, as the latest figures show. Time on site is up, sign-ups are growing month on month, and we're serving more visitors than ever. But that's not all. We've launched dozens of new features since our beta, and we're about to release one of the most important updates in the company's history. Dan, why don't you tell us all about it? There's not much to say, really, I said. We're looking to monetize our visitors and to show our investors that the site could become a cash cow, so we're launching the ability for people to purchase virtual gifts to leave on the pages of dead friends and relatives. That's the plan, said John. Right now, we have 25 million active users and over 19,000 deaths. Those stats might sound impressive, but they're still on the rise and we're on course to double that in less than a year. I'll be circulating some usage goals before the end of the week, and Peter and I want you to work towards them. Formally is a team effort, and we need your help if we're going to take over the world. Who's with me? That was the latest instalment of Formally, the rise and fall of a social network by myself, Dan Cobain, for this week's Rye Light Zone. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. i 
some kind of trick because it's like living in the matrix isn't it that was some music by Mika England you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound I'm your host Dan Cobain and it's time for us to be joined by this week's guest who is the very talented Mika England okay so the first question is one that I ask everybody and it's what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it I, I, I have to say I spend most of my time on Cora or um uh other question and answer uh sites it's almost completely uh that the last book i remember was uh surely you're joking mr feynman which is a biography you mentioned cora so do you write answers on that or do you just read the answers uh no i i write um a fair bit um either marketing or um uh, 40 years a creative director or um a trans uh trans questions Cool. Awesome. And I want to actually ask you about both of those. Um, and so if we start with the marketing, uh, what's yeah. like, what's your, your background? So as you say, 40 years of marketing, you've been an art director. Um, you know, what, so where did you get your start and where, where did your career take you? Um, I was really lucky. Uh, I got a job, um, almost straight away after college from, um, an agency, which doesn't exist now. Uh, it's become several th- other things. Um, but it was the one that did the Smash Martians, uh, Courage Best, you know, names that uh, most uh, 50-year-old pluses will know. Uh, Hofmeister, uh, Follow the Bear. Um, oh, it was an uh, amazing uh, place to start. Um, so uh, we never got any TV while I was there. Um, the best we got was um, uh, Quaker Oats porridge, a steaming bowl of porridge and a fixed camera. Um, with a guy blowing uh, cigarette smoke into it to make it look like it was boiling. <laughs> so uh, that wasn't very glamorous. And then, um, uh, but then uh, straight after that, uh, started uh, jo- uh, joining other agencies, top 20 agencies. And uh, yeah, it sort of like racked up there to the point where um, we were turning out a lot of uh, award winning work. And um, yeah, it was, um, it was awesome. It was, uh, it was a very, very crazy different period to today. It wasn't very woke. <laughs> awesome. And uh, and obviously you mentioned uh, that you're trans as well. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your, your trans journey. 
Um, yeah, I was um, in Chicago. I was very um, working for a German company, uh, very, very lonely. I had a lot of time and introspection for introspection. Um, and uh, I've always been uncomfortable, really uncomfortable um, with groups of men, mm. especially when they get into the back slapping. <laughs> yeah. And the, typical, the typical ad agency world as well. Yeah, Ab absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was manifestly uncomfortable with that. Um, and, um, yeah, I just, just uh, started if I if I thought about it, it because it was in Chicago on the the Oxford Street of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't exactly a place that you could uh, sort of slip out, to, you know, and sort of slowly start to. Um, yeah, but go, going out, um, I, I knew a lot of the uh, gay community from the uh, waiters and waitresses uh, who were serving there. And um, they they supported me um, uh, to uh, start the transformation. Yeah. So that was just progressive. By the time I came back to England uh, in uh, December 2018, I was uh, wearing women's clothes and presenting the whole time. Awesome. Cool. And I wonder, do you think, does being a trans woman affect your art and music at all? Um, well, it's interesting because I did a Myers-Briggs uh, test uh, years ago mm -hmm. uh, when I was presenting as a man, and that was uh, INTP. Mm -hmm. um, now I, I did it again. Uh, I've done it twice, and it came out INFP, which is rather than thinking, feeling. Feeling, yeah. So That's, that's the same type that my uh, my girlfriend is, actually. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I'm, and I'm I, I'm an INTJ, so I'm a thinker and a judger. I think that's interesting. And um, uh, the somebody, another musician, actually asked me, uh, "Has your music thing changed?" It's difficult to tell because I actually started writing uh, some of my more uh, punk numbers, like um, "The Ugly Rit." Um, I actually started writing that when um, uh, I was transforming. So. Uh, it's difficult to say mm. is it different is it different than it was well i never really wrote music or or sang or, or all the rest of it that was another thing actually um going out and singing in front of people as a trans woman yeah and as a freshly cracked one and i have to say wow um i really didn't know how to i mean i'm not sure i do now but i mean then it you know i look at pictures of that and go Ooh, blimey that was uh, yo, that was that, that was hard to look at um so um you know but it but it it got me out there and uh taught me to confront people um and not be um maybe uh sort of ultimately i i had in mind oh i'll i'll, I'll become a much more reclusive retiring shy quiet feminine sort of woman and uh that's not the way it's worked out yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, cool. And in terms of your music, how long have you been making music and sort of where did you get your start with it? Um, I've been playing guitar um, since I was 20, uh, around 20. I never I never got into playing cover versions ever mm. because, it's a, because one, I'm not a good enough musician to play cover versions. And that's the basic reason. But then the second one was when I started playing 12 string, which I started immediately. Um, I started discovering chords that weren't in the books and, you know, I, I'd sort of like go, oh, C minus sixth diminished seventh. Yeah. Well, I don't know what that is, but it sounds wonderful next to this one. So I I, I actually just ramped up the uh, chord progressions uh, using a lot of open strings, which the 12 string allows you to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I've never gone back to six string. And in fact, you know, I can't actually play it mm -hmm. because I, I, I don't get that thing of, oh, that sounds so, I don't know, melodious, or this one sounds so rich, or this one sounds so sad. Yeah. It just doesn't sound like that on the on the six string. So cool, awesome. And I wanted to ask you about your like your equipment. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the twelve string that you play, and then uh, any other any other gear that you use? Yeah, um, the uh, it's an Italia, which is a uh, 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 luthier, um, an English luthier uh, designed it, uh, and it's built in South Korea from uh, um, uh, Japanese maple, I believe. Um, it's a twelve string, which is not the same as a Rickenbacker twelve. The Rickenbacker twelve has uh, the bass strings first as you hit them, uh, whereas the Italia is the other way around. It's uh, actually got the thin strings first. 
So it's a slightly more trebly sound. People tell me it's much more um, Brit, Brit kind of uh, sounding. Um, so that's the Italia. It's got uh, two pickups. Um, it's just, and it's a semi-acoustic. It's it's just freaking wonderful. It's called mm -hmm. a Rimini. Um, and the other one is a Fender 12 string. It's got automatic tuning. It's got an internal pickup. So you can uh, play straight and, you know, just plug and play mm -hmm. uh, straight away. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a beautiful uh, sounding uh, guitar as well. Cool. And so you sort of perform under the name of Mika and the Transients. And I wondered, like, is that is that just you? Is there a, a group that goes with that? And uh, where does the name come from as well? Um, it uh, <laughs> There was a Mika and the Transients. Um, yeah, um, I had a, a good friend who was uh, a drummer. Mm -hmm. uh al and he was uh one of the first transients and then uh also you may know vish tank mm -hmm. uh, vish played uh played with us some um, and we'd go to pirate studios in notting hill and uh, we'd play together and it was vish and al who came up with the idea of the tra uh, transients um uh they they would actually dead set on saying mika and the mm. and then we just went went through loads and loads and either al would go nee, or vish would go nee. and uh the transients was the only one that um uh, everyone just went yeah i love that cool awesome and so you sort of mentioned sort of studios there. i wondered like um do you do recording and if so um like is is are any of your recordings available anywhere um i'm just doing it now um that's the first the first time i'm play um i'm recorded uh three songs at uh heavy traffic music um th there's a guitar shop a wonderful guitar shop in langley uh and it's behind there there are two small studios uh and i recorded there uh um, feel like a girl the ugly writ and zeros and ones uh and we're uh hopefully mixing next week I've uh, got all the drums sorted. It's just a case now of getting the, finishing the keyboards and getting uh, balances. Cool. Awesome. And um, one of the things that, that I think is pretty cool about you, so you, you live on a houseboat, right? Do you still live on the houseboat? Yes. Cool. So what's the houseboat called and what's it like to live on a houseboat? Uh, it's called Serendipity. Um, it's... Uh, my partner always says... Uh, she always says, uh, oh, it's uh, it's a big responsibility it is uh because the, the first thing everybody says is is it cold mm. the answer to that is well no not as long as you've uh had the foresight to either order up your wood if you're burning wood or coal or whatever it is um and um but you know there comes the night where you come home a bit drunk it's cold <laughs> you forgot to order the uh, gas so you can't have hot water you forgot to uh, and you can't have a cup of tea because the gas isn't working the electricity's uh, flipped. You know, it it conspires that everything tends to be uh, tends to happen at the same time. Mm. Um, and it's uh, two people even living on this is a long boat. It's a narrow boat, but it's long. It's seventy foot long. So um, you know, if you drop your jumper, it's it's an obstacle to the other person. So yeah. you know, you have to be pretty aware of uh, keeping everything neat and um yeah it's uh it's it but it's a lot of fun you're much more connected with the weather yeah much more much more connected um to the point where you actually notice the seasons change and when i was working in big agencies you know i'd go in in the dark during winter i'd drive in on a motorbike um get changed and it would start being light by about eight o'clock and by that time i'd gone through all my emails and then the, the next problem was coming in yeah you no, know, I, I just didn't notice time for uh, time passing, but um, the the boat really makes you uh, engage with the weather and um, really appreciate it too. Cool. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Mika England, and this is another one of Mika's songs.
That was another tune by Mika England. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with Mika England. And I, I wondered, what's it like being a musician who lives on a boat? Because obviously you've got your gear, um, and also I suppose it's not as though, like in a house or something, you might be able to have a bit more of a soundproof room or go to the other side of the house or something. Um, whereas I suppose you, you can't really do that on a boat. So what, what's it like to be a, a boater and a musician at the same time? Um, there's a lot of us. Um, uh, there are there is a lot of us, even in my little stretch, which is uh, probably about thirty boats. You know, end to end. Um, there, are, yeah, there are quite a few. A uh, couple of dr- drummers. I don't know. I have no <laughs> no idea how they how they work. Um, uh, but quite a few guitarists, uh, saxophone, trumpeter. So um, yeah, I mean, they make it they make it work. Actually. The soundproofing is probably better than a house, mm. probably certainly than a semi-detached or um, you know, uh, uh, a tenement block because yeah. um, you know, uh, the wood and the insulation sucks in a lot of the sound. 
So um, I, I, I think as far as the neighbours are concerned, they're they're fine with it. Yeah. They never they never complain. Um, and we do well. My partner's deaf, so right. um, that's quite fun because uh, you know um, sometimes she can be asleep and I can be absolutely blasting away at the yeah. things. Don't have to put headphones on, um, and she's blissfully asleep. So. Cool, awesome. And so, but sort of back onto the subject of music. And you mentioned you've only really been sort of songwriting sort of more recently. Uh, what does the songwriting process look like to you? Are you kind of do you start with a concept? Do you do lyrics first? Do you do chords first? Um, how does a song typically come about for you? Uh, yeah, I would say normally the the chords begin to suggest a type of song. Um, uh, I mean, feel like a girl is quite is. It's quite poppy. It, I mean, I have to say secretly, well, not secretly now, but I, I kind of hear Katy Perry singing it, you know, which mm. is a bit, um, um, you know, and actually, that, I'll tell you what, that one was quite interesting. I started out with this with more or less the same chords played at half speed, half the speed, and it was called Sorrow Lullaby. And I just, um, I'd worked out the lyrics, uh, I, you know, and the, the chords were good but um when i s sang them it just didn't feel genuine it didn't mm. feel like it was coming from me it sounded like uh i was just putting a load of words in about i wasn't being specific about what i was feeling sorrow about yeah uh, and i wasn't feeling it wasn't painful nor was it any kind of you know uh i wasn't giving myself uh, it wasn't confidential yeah. It wasn't it wasn't genuine. Um and my girlfriend said, um, actually, uh, why don't you why don't you speed it up? I mean, if you if you're finding it's a bit of a grind and a dirge, why don't you speed mm. it up? I did, found one particular chord, which is an off chord, it's really good. Um, and that just suggested this thing of uh, a, a woman in high heels just um giving it the big one. Yeah. And um yeah, uh, that's where I um, feel like a girl um, uh, started. Um, that feeling of a, it's it's about a meeting of a uh, of a girl with a another an, another partner. It never says so if it's a boy or a girl, and um, absolutely dying for them to offer to take the take her to bed, but um, but they won't do it. Yeah. So it's that feeling of impatience of, uh, oh, Jesus, do we have to keep talking about, you know, oh, where do you come from? Oh, yeah. oh, oh. That sort of uh, sort of thing of uh, I'm absolutely I'm yours. All you have to do is take it. And yeah. um, if you keep, you know, if you keep talking, I'm just I'm going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and it was it was uh, that was the story. And that seemed much closer to reality. Yeah. Awesome, cool. And I wondered, like, has COVID affected your your music at all? Um, and as a kind of a sister question to that, how important do you think um, music is in sort of the post COVID world? That's a great question. Um, during COVID, um, I actually stopped writing and playing. Yeah, I, I found it really, really depressing to watch people playing um, cover versions of things and. Most of them weren't very good. Yeah. I mean, the huge majority weren't very good. And that made me actually just kind of go, I, I just can't be bothered. Yeah. Um, the fact that I didn't have people, and remember, uh, you know, I, as I said, uh, I was used to playing out, out busking. Yeah. So I really missed the immediacy of having people. I even prefer having people dislike something that I'm doing than nothing. Yeah. Um, you want so, that kind of response. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so that's during the COVID period. I, I really went off it um, completely, uh, and it, I found it very difficult to get back into my uh, groove. It's mm. probably taken a half half a year, if not more, to begin to get back into um, being interested in it again. And um, part of that's doing lots of open mics and what have you. Um, yeah, it's interesting what you say about um, in the post COVID thing. It's it it seems like groups are a really low uh low interest and single people doing everything uh you know mixing everything mm. on their own um on their own um so there's a lot of how you know house uh drum and bass 
da 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 da, da you know, a trance, all of that stuff. Um, I think that's much higher interest. Uh, when you sort of say I'm a band or we're a band, then I, I think people tend to sort of go, it's a bit, it feels a bit passe. I think, yeah. I don't know, that's my personal feeling. Yeah. I think that's what people are feeling. Well, it's interesting because I suppose there are a couple of factors in, in that as well. So the one is obviously that whole the whole social distancing thing. So if you've got one performer rather than four, then it's like a lower risk for the sort of COVID transmission. But also I think, especially when you look at like the economy and pubs struggling to stay afloat and the energy crisis and all of this, I suppose booking like a DJ is generally cheaper than booking a band because you're paying one person rather than four or five people, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I buy into that. Cool. I, it seems to me, uh, I mean, I watch a lot, I, I, because of my job, I, I look at a lot of social media, you know, yeah. all, all of them. And it just seems to me that the uh, the band is is really not well covered in social media. And uh, I, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, maybe it's, it, it feels a bit old. Yeah. I shouldn't say that because I am a bit <laughs> old. But, um, well, I mean, it, I, I suppose... I suppose that's happened before as well, though. Like you have mo you have periods when the band kind of falls out of favour, and then I don't know something like Britpop happens, and then suddenly it's really cool to have a band again. And then you know, then I don't know whatever happens, like then it, the focus changes to rap or whatever, and suddenly everyone wants just a rapper. So it does seem as though it kind of comes and goes in waves. So perhaps we're just in one of those off waves. I suppose only the only the could future will, will tell. Yeah, it could be. Cool. So, and you mentioned uh, open mics and also busking. I wondered if you could share uh, like a few of your favourite venues to play and potentially some of your favourite busking spots as well. Um, well, in Britain, uh, the uh, opposite, opposite. Oh, God, it's near. It's in Piccadilly. It's just one of the uh, things off that, and it's outside a, a club. Uh, Bill Nighy came out. Uh, came out, hmm. and I was um. Oh, sorry. He came in actually from a uh, a limo. Yeah, and I, I was playing. Uh, I think it was Salt in the Wound, uh, and he was very sweet. He uh, got out a 20, twenty quid note, lifted up my jumper, which was on my guitar case, to make sure that it didn't blow mm. away. Put it under very carefully, and then gave me a lovely smile and uh, walked into the club. So, um, thank you, Bill. <laughs> um, nice. Uh, so uh, that's near Cafe Ziegler. Ziegler. Um, uh, there's uh, also the Embankment, which is, I, I really love it there. It's so scuzzy. It's fantastic. Um, uh, Camden is good. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not really doing it for, uh, for the money. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it 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 I don't measure I don't measure it in terms of did I make um uh, money or not. It's just did I enjoy it or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, playing. Uh, I saw um uh, a young girl playing at uh, HMV. Mm -hmm. As you know, they do um uh, these uh, sort of like spots, and I just thought, and her mother was sort of like hiding behind the record so that nobody could see um uh that she was actually really really worried about her and looking out mm. for any um um but the, you know i just sort of thought oh yeah that's that's cool i thought that was uh that was a great thing to see her um uh braving it out awesome cool okay and um just one well it's kind of two questions in one to end on so um what's next for you and where can people uh go to find out more um I've got a, 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 a Facebook site, um, especially for uh, music, which is T Girl at sixty. That's uh, A T at, and sixty is the number. T Girl at sixty dot com, um, and that's on Facebook. Uh, I'm on SoundCloud as Mika England. Mm -hmm. um, and what's next? Um, I, as I say, I've just started recording and putting stuff together. Uh, I've got done a vi I cut a video uh, a couple of days ago for um which one was it? Uh not feel like a girl. Oh zeros and ones. Um which is a slow one. Um and it seems to be getting a gentle uh, thing. It's doing very well on TikTok. Oh, yeah. well, TikTok is uh, um Mika England. I was going to say I've I've seen that one pop up on my TikTok a few times. Ah oh, okay. 
Good. Um, so, uh, you know, that's uh, that's future. I'm going to start taking it much more seriously. We're going to in about two weeks, I'm going to start recording another three. Mm. Um, so that'll be six. Um, and then, you know, again, uh, in another month, I'll do another uh, another three, um, hopefully uh, to get enough together for uh, putting it on Spotify and um, hopefully um, selling some things. I, I, I can't see. I, I don't know. If anybody knows really where this is going, where sales are going to come from, yeah. unless you really hit it big. Um, but uh, I guess the thing to do is just concentrate on the music and make sure that it's as genuine and um, real as I can make it. That's it. And making it available as well. And I suppose kind of as you were saying, it's uh, quite often it's less about the money. And I think from what I've seen, most of the the... Um, people I've seen have been saying sort of like merch sales and like specifically like things like t-shirts, t-shirts and concert tickets. That's where a lot of people are making the money, but that's difficult to do when you're a solo artist because I don't know, it seems a bit big headed to, you know, to have a t-shirt on it that's just got your name on it, you know? Oh, I've got no problem with that. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Good. Get some t-shirts made. That can, Definitely. Be, that can be for 2023. And beanies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You Well, you could sell those on the... Um, on the river as well, couldn't you? Definitely. Meet people when they're coming back from the pub and they forgot to uh, they forgot to buy their their wood and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I could do that with my trade on uh, uh, bikes that we fish out of the. Uh, there are a lot of them. Yeah, fishing fishing a whole bike out of the uh, canal. I imagine there are like shopping trolleys as well. Um. Uh, yeah, up at Slough, uh, Slough end, but um, our end, um, uh, we've uh, got a new species of really invasive weed. Right, yeah. It, it means, um, you know, they get wrapped around the propeller and you're forever yeah. lifting the um, weed hatch to uh, cut it off, yeah. cut them off. Yeah. Big thank you to Mika England for joining me. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed for this week's album review, courtesy of Twangling Jack Ford. Squeeze. The essential squeeze. As a North Londoner, to me there was something unknown, unknowable and almost exotic about South East London. But I expected the name of Squeeze's first record label, Deptford Fun City, was ironic. They released an EP with the typically playful title of A Packet of Three. It was the same kind of saucy innuendo that turned up in lyrics like I'm invited in for coffee and I give the dog a bone and behind the chalet the holiday is complete I feel like William Tell made Marion on her tiptoe feet pulling muscles from a shell. Once you get the joke you wonder how they got such massive daytime airplay. The first hit single, Take Me I'm Yours, was a puzzle to me because I wondered why even a producer as eccentric as John Cale of the Velvet Underground would put distortion on the lead vocal. But as they became more successful and appeared on TV, I noted the effect was caused by Chris Difford singing in a deep, rough voice beneath Glenn Tilbrook's softer, higher vocal. Difford was the lyricist and wrote great observations on London life. Like Ray Davis before him, his songs were populated by lifelike characters. The life story of the man who met a girl from Clapham in Up the Junction. The woman who drinks to forget her wartime past in Labelled with Love. And the death of his friend's partner in Some Fantastic Place. Nothing for me invokes a sense of place and time better than the simple line the sunlight on the lino. As someone who played in a band at the time, Glenn Tilbrook had everything I wished I had. Good looks, a melodic voice, and a Stratocaster with which he could punctuate his catchy verses and choruses with tastefully flash solos. It seemed to me that no lead singer in a pop band should be able to suddenly perform a solo such as the one in Another Nail in My Heart. And they were so versatile for a band of their age. Sometimes synth pop, sometimes a classic guitar rock band, sometimes country and sometimes soul. The original Squeeze had Jules Holland on piano and Gilson Laveris, who is now in Jules's band, on drums. They had no permanent bass player, the one Squeeze trait I seem to have managed to adopt. Wherever there is a rack of bargain CDs, this one can be found. 
Until doing this recommendation, I had never felt the need to own any squeeze, nor even go out of my way to listen to them. That is because every lyric and tune on all but the last few songs of this album are part of my very being. They're about the kind of places and the kind of people I know, and they were always there at a time in my life when I studied such things. But you need to go and listen to this album because it is brilliant. Squeeze. The Essential Squeeze. Big thank you for Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Mika England for being my guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. And thank you to you for listening, of course. As always, if you miss an episode, we're repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with MP3s, anybody who thinks there might be a good guest. Don't hesitate to get in touch. So that's it for this week's show. I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Demon's Love Again by Kit Goff. I'll see you next week. <laughs> I got your love